16th, Karen Yi and Andre Xu and I thought it might be useful to assemble a highlights of the MBS Foundation Symposium 2021. To do this, we each reviewed seven plenary educational lectures and extracted some key messages and learnings that resonated with us. For those who attended the Congress, this will consolidate your learning. And for those who did not, it's a great overview of the excellent content covered by our incredible talented speakers and hopefully motivate you to watch their talks in toto since they will be up on this platform for the next three months. Now, this is not a comprehensive review of all three and a half days. We don't include content from the trainee advice sessions, the scientific workshops, the debates, the oral abstracts and poster pitches that were all superb, as well as the um, award sessions. So please uh, feel free to uh, investigate those at your leisure. So um, David Solomon from the Moffitt provided a great overview of the inflammasome pathway and how it contributes to pyroptosis and ineffective hematopoiesis. A component of the NLRP inflammasome are what are called ASC specs. And these can actually be detected by ELISA in the peripheral blood. And what his lab has shown is that these ASC specs may also be useful for diagnostic purposes, especially in ambiguous cases where you suspect the diagnosis of MBS but can't prove it. And um, he showed compared to healthy controls and uh, other hematologic cancers not shown on this slide, such as lymphomas, that in comparison with healthy controls and others, that patients with MBS have higher rates of these ASC specs that can be detected by ELISA and using an ROC curve, the presence of increased ASC specs has, a, for especially for lower risk MBS, a very high AUC of 95%. These can also be detected by special microscopy. So that may be in the future a diagnostic tool for us. In addition, um, there may be a predictive value to investigating ASC specs. For example, they looked at the presence or absence of elevated ASC specs in the randomized trial of patients receiving LEN plus EPO versus EPO uh, versus lenalidomide alone in ESA non-responders in uh, the GFM study. And patients who had high ASC specs and low serum EPO had actually a very high response, whereas those who lacked um, ASC specs and had a high serum EPO had a very low response. He also then target, uh, discussed in detail in his wonderful talk um, various different agents under investigation to target the inflammasome and improve ineffective hematopoiesis and decrease pyroptosis, um, such as canakinabab and NLRP3 inhibitors. And he also spoke about this CA4948, which um, interferes with uh, IRAC4 long form isoform expression, which it seems to be increased in patients who have spliceosome mutations that lead to um, elevated NF kappa B activation and inflammatory cytokines. Oh, so as you heard from Marina, systemic inflammation in the microenvironment plays a role in the development and progression of MDS. However, the mechanism by which uh, MDS hematopoietic stem progenitor cells selectively acquire a clonal advantage over normal hematopoietic stem progenitor cells are unclear. So TRAS6 is a ring type E3 ubiquitin ligase. TRAS6 is overexpressed in about 40% of patients with MDS, and overexpression of TRAS6 is associated with poor outcome in patients with MDS. Uh, stimulation of the toll-like receptor leads to recruitment of an adapter protein called MID-D88, uh, which then binds to the activated receptor complex, recruits IRAC4, uh, which activates IRAC1, TRAF6 is activated by IRAC1 and leads to NF-kappa B activation. And NF-kappa B is important for inflammation and innate uh, immunity. Next. So Dr. Storsinowski's group has shown that hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, which overexpress TRAF6, have increased inflammatory and immune-mediated gene expression signatures. They're also intrinsically more competitive and exhibit serial clonal advantage under inflammatory conditions compared to normal hematopoietic uh, stem cells. 
Furthermore, what they demonstrated was that there was increased expression of non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling via activation of A20. A20 is a ubiquitin modifying enzyme, which is responsible for switching from a canonical to non-canonical NF-kappa B signaling. And what A20 does is it removes ubiquitin from TRAF6, therefore decreasing signaling through canonical NF-kappa B. And it stabilizes uh, at NIC by binding to it and leads to increased activity or signaling through the non-canonical NF-kappa B. So activation of, oops, still on the slide. Sorry, so activation of canonical NF-kappa B leads to cellular apoptosis, whereas when you get signaling through the non-canonical NF-kappa B, it's not been reported to lead to increased apoptosis. So this is the mechanism to explain the selective clonal expansion of MDS or hematopoietic stem progenitor cells or um, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells that overexpress TRAF6 over normal hematopoietic stem progenitor cells. And this activity could be abrogated by inhibiting A20 activity, indicating that this may be a target for further development in clinical space. Okay, next. I'd like to say a few words um, about uh, bone marrow niche contributions to MDS pathogenesis uh, presentation uh, by Hind Medu from uh, Frankfurt. Next. Uh, Dr. Medu first started off by reviewing um, concepts of the marrow microenvironment. Next. And in particular, she focused on this paradigm here um, that illustrates um, in a cartoon form reciprocal interaction actions between stem cells um, and the microenvironment and focuses on changes that occur in these reciprocal interactions during aging, uh, during the acquisition of chip with aging, and also in disease states. Next. Um, she then went on in what, what I would call a, a very tasty appetite stimulant um, to tell us about new in vivo and in, in vitro models that her lab is using to help us understand these reciprocal interactions between the MDS hematopoietic stem cell and the aging or illness-associated narrow microenvironment. And in particular, she talked about um, an in vivo model um, in which uh, spark knockout mice were bred onto a kit W41 homozygous background that improves engraftment. And she previously showed that with aging, spark levels in the bone marrow decrease. Um, and while this is early days for this model, I have a feeling it's going to be highly, highly informative, and I look forward to um, her data. She also talked about two clever um, in vitro models, a 2D and an even nicer, a 3D human organotypic marrow environment co-culture. Again, it's early days, um, but I think that this approach is going to help dissect some of these uh, stromal cell, uh, stem cell interactions. So in the next few years, I think we're going to be hearing a lot from her. Next. Okay, so we're going to change gears to talk about clonal hematopoiesis. So there's a number of factors that can modulate uh, clonal expansion of cells that contain pre-leukemia genes, such as exposures to toxins, such as chemotherapy or radiation, where you get an increased growth, sometimes of cells containing TP53. Similarly, uh, when uh, cells are exposed to chronic inflammation or infection, you could get outgrowth or increased growth of cells containing DNMT3A. Uh, next. Okay, so Dr. Schloch uh, looked at um, whether bone marrow fat can modulate clonal hematopoiesis. There's some evidence suggesting that bone marrow adipose tissue is an endocrine organ and is able to do paracrine staining singularly. So with increased age, there's increased marrow fat. Uh, furthermore, there is a change in um, which gender has more marrow fat depending on age. If for people under the age of 60, males have more marrow fat than females, but um, after menopause, age 60 and older, females have more marrow fat than males. What he was able to demonstrate was that the accumulation of fatty bone marrow with increased age provided a selective advantage 
where hematopoietic stem progenitor cells carrying DNMT3A mutations via increased secretion of IL-6. And this can be aggregated by exposing the cells to the edge, which is a PARP gamma inhibitor, which inhibits um, bone marrow ad typogenesis. And similarly, it could be aggregated by exposing the cells to monoclonal IL-6. Okay, next. Um, so the next uh, speaker was uh, Dr. Ebert, who talked about uh, clonal hematopoiesis. Um, so there's three different types of clonal hematopoiesis. Uh, the ones that we're used to hearing about is somatic mutations that are usually found in myeloid malignancies, which encompass point mutations or small insertions or deletions in individual genes. Uh, another type of clonal hematopoiesis is mosaic copy number abnormalities, which involve gains or losses of large chromosomal material, such as having a deletion 7Q or deletion 5Q. And the third is clonal hematopoiesis without any known drivers, and which is marked by skewing of X and chromosome inactivation or passenger mutations at similar VAFs. So he has an interest in looking at not just myelin, but also lymphoid chip in a cohort of patients um, that were uh, gathered in the UK Biobank and it comprised about 50,000 patients. And what he showed was that myeloid chip is more prevalent than lymphoid chip. And that's a both the myeloid and lymphoid chip increase with increasing age. Uh, next. So he demonstrated that um, individuals who have myeloid chip have an increased uh, risk of developing myeloid malignancies. It's only about 2% of 10 years' time, but it's still statistically significant. Similarly, uh, individuals who have lymphoid chip are at increased risk of developing a lymphoid malignancy. Usually CLL or some other circulating lymphoid um, malignancy and not a nodal lymphoid malignancy, uh, meaning not uh, something like a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Uh, I haven't shown this, but it's also recapitulated in individuals who have a myeloid or lymphoid um, mosaic copy number aber aberrations. Furthermore, as uh, demonstrated by other studies, uh, having multiple mutations is worse than having a single mutation. So for individuals who have both a myeloid chip and a mosaic copy number aberration, there is about a 30-fold increased risk of developing a myeloid malignancy. Similarly, for individuals with lymphoid chip, and a lymphoid mosaic copy number abnormality, there is a hundredfold increased risk of developing a lymphoid malignancy and minimal or no increased risk of developing some sort of myeloid malignancy. Okay, uh, next. So his other interest was looking at associations of chromal hematopoiesis or CHIP with non-malignant disorders. As you recall, CHIP has been associated with development of uh, cardiovascular disease, such as stroke and uh, coronary artery disease. So he looked specifically at um, four data banks, um, consist and aggregated all the information to yield information in about 49,000 patients to look at the association of CHIP with COPD. And what he was able to demonstrate with this large data set was that CHIP was associated with severe to very severe COPD. Furthermore, looking at a specific clinical parameter, this was validated looking at CHIP and demonstrating that CHIP is associated with decreased predicted FEV1. There's also a small um, association with smoking and increased risk of CHIP. It's about 3% uh, with 10-year pack year smoking. Okay, uh, next. So Ellie Papanui provided a first glimpse at the IWGPM, the long-awaited revision of our prognostic scoring system and MDS. 
Um, it was derived from uh, over 3,000 high-quality patient samples for which they had very detailed clinical and molecular annotation. Um, and this was what was, it's from 25 centers around the world, and this is what was used to develop um, the IPSSM. It was then also validated in a separate Japanese cohort. So um, some novel um, insights from their analysis were that um, in, in developing this model is that bone marrow blasts, hemoglobin, and platelet count linearly correlated with the risk continuum, but A and C did not. So neutrophils are not in the final model, um, including individual cytogenetic events did not improve the risk model discrimination. So five categories of cytogenetic risk are in the IPS, as, we're, as we see in the IPSSR, are retained in the final model. And they considered the, the, um, the gene core that were correlated with the clinical outcomes of leukemia-free survival, overall survival, and ANL transformation. And out of um, more than 126 mapped genes, they identified 21 main gene effects to be considered um, that are listed over here. Um, and while 21 discrete genes correlated the best with clinical outcome, um, the top three most important genes are listed here, multi-hit TP53, ML MLL PTD, which is seen in 2.5% of the patients, and FLT3 ITD and TKD together. And by the way, um, only two-thirds of patients who harbor TP53 mutation have multi-hit um, disease. The number of mutations also mattered. Um, and so um, if you have two or more mutations in any of these 17 genes that are not included in this, in this main model, this also added to the um, uh, risk um, estimation. So it's an additional component in the final score. So they have then now developed this patient-tailored risk score that will require an online calculator for your patients that considers um, clinical variables, cytogenetics, as genetics, um, gene mutations, and then these uh, the number of these 17 gene residuals, as long as you have two or more. And it divides patients up into six risk categories, um, as you can see in this, um, in this graph very low, low, um, moderate, low, moderate, high, high, and very high. So compared to an individual um, average patient with a score of zero, any increase in your hazard ratio of one doubles your risk, but a decrease in your score uh, to minus one um, halves your risk of an adverse outcome. And uh, these six risk strata um, separate out very nicely when you look at the leukemia-free and overall survival curves of these patients. So they're highly distinguishing uh, of for prognosis for these endpoints. Um, and in fact, when they looked at how IPSSM performed compared to the IPSSR, it re-stratified 46% of the patients, with 34% being upstaged and 12% being downstaged. The C-index, which is a model fit of the IPSSM, was significantly improved compared to the IPSSR. Um, they validated their findings in a distinct Japanese MDS cohort of patients of um, more than 750 patients. And they found that this model was agnostic to whether or not you have secondary or therapy-related MDS. So it could be applicable in this patient population, which is um, not as relevant. Um, to, you can't say that about the IPSSR, where um, its, its ability to predict survival while validated um, shows significantly inferior survivals um, for different risk groups. We then now can expect an online calculator to come when the publication uh, is uh, in press, uh, that where we can uh, plug in our patients' variables that were considered, and we will get an individual risk calculator for leukemia-free survival, survival, and AML transformation risk. And it'll be put in context for other patients. Okay, I'd like to talk briefly about uh, uh, a presentation by Dr. Amit Verma uh, from New York, who uh, focused on TGF-beta pathway targeting approaches and also talked about the IRAC-4 pathway. So to begin with, he reviewed TGF-beta and IRAC-4 pathways and MDS. Um, with respect to TGF-beta, 
Um, he reviewed his data for showing increased SMAD 2 and 3 activation in MDS and in parallel loss of SMAD 7 activity in MDS. Um, he reviewed the structure and mechanism of action of Los Patercept. And then he discussed a note, uh, some data uh, in vitro showing that Los Patercept binds the TGF beta family member GDF11 and by doing so can restore ineffective erythropoiesis in vitro. Next. Uh, he focused on the, he, he again worked his way through the IRAC4 signaling pathway that I believe Dr. Yi has already uh, addressed earlier um, uh, today in this session. Next. And he, with respect to this, uh, reiterated that uh, UTAF1 mutations uh, lead to the production of an activating the long isoform of IRAC4 in the case of UTAF1 via the inclusion in the long form of exon 4. In contrast, SF3B1 mutations also lead to the production of an activating long isoform of IRAC4 but it's via a different mechanism. In this case, with the mutation in SF3B1, um, it's exon 6 that is included in the final uh, process uh, transcript rather than exon 4. And then he talked also about um, CA4948, an IRAC4 kinase inhibitor, which blocks IRAC4 um, long form resulting from both mutations, both in vitro and in vivo. And he alluded to a clinical trial of this compound in MDS um, that also was mentioned uh, a couple of times during this meeting. Next. The next speaker uh, was Uwe Platzbecker from Leipzig, and he reviewed very comprehensively and very nicely the management of low-risk disease um, in MDS. And essentially, he worked his way through this figure here, um, but looking at the individual columns on the left-hand side for thrombocytopenia, um, in the middle, anemia with DEL5Q, and on the right-hand side, anemia and non-DEL5Q, and worked through all of the standard approaches that we would follow, speculated about new drugs, and also talked about clinical trials. This was a very comprehensive review. It was useful for me to, to hear this. Of the newish approved drugs that he put into this uh, figure were Luspatercept, of course. He also talked a little bit about oral azocytidine, and how it might influence thrombocytopenia and anemia. Doug, drugs that are currently in clinical trial that he alluded were toxatostat, uh, which is an uh, HIF, a HIF uh, which functions as a HIF modulator, and imitelstat, which is a telomerase inhibitor. They're both in study in clinical trials. And then he alluded to a number of future concepts that are not really yet in clinical trial, but I suspect that in the next few years, We'll be hearing more about this. He speculated about um, the modulation of the hepcidin ferroportin axis. Uh, he speculated about therapeutic modulation of inflammasome activation. He mentioned modulation of FGF23, uh, which is upregulated in, in some cases of MDS. And he speculated about the modulation of TP53. So while his approach uh, is quite different from what we would have done 10 or 15 years ago, the story's not over. There are many more new drugs to come in the next few years. The next speaker I want to mention is Gil Saar from Philadelphia, who spoke in the cellular and immune therapy session. And in particular, he talked about cellular and immune therapy uh, strategies in MDS, uh, focusing particularly on CAR T cells. He started off with an overall review of different approaches for immunotherapy and MDS, as shown in this figure here. Next. And in particular, he then focused in on three approaches. One was immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, he was a little bit uh, negative about the potential for immune checkpoint inhibitors to influence um, MDS outcomes, although um, the CD47 don't eat me signal um, remains to be seen how that pans out. He very briefly mentioned vaccines, and then he focused for the large part on enhancing immune cells. Next. And in this regard, he focused on uh, five different approaches, uh, bites, bispecific NK cell engagers, the adoptive transfer, adoptive transfer of ACANs, uh, NK cells, the adoptive, adoptive transfer of T cells, and finally, the adoptive transfer of engineered cells or CAR T cells. Next. <laughs> 
and he enumerated the problems. Why are CAR T cells are making such a big splash in lymphoid uh, neoplasms, but in myeloid neoplasms, they're lagging far behind. Um, he explained this in, in great detail. First of all, myeloid malignancies have relatively few somatic mutations. So one could speculate that there's a, a dearth of neoantigen targets in, in these malignancies. He gave some lab data showing that you know, in, in MDS and in AML, there was a relatively weak phenotype-genotype relationship in contrast to other diseases. Um, it's often difficult to distinguish normal cells from their malignant counterparts. Um, but that observation that drives this whole field is that allogeneic uh, stem cell transplantation is quite efficacious. So similar for other malignancies 10 or 15 years ago, um, it's the promise that we could recapitulate in the autologous setting uh, what is already observed in the allogeneic setting that keeps this field going. Next. He finally uh, described an approach from his lab um, in an, uh, which is being used in an attempt to identify new targets. And he talked about the MDS immunome, and in particular in his lab. Next uh, slide. He showed an approach where he combines, where they combine single cell analysis. So first of all, single, single cell mutational analysis. And here's a figure showing single cells uh, would either have a P53 mutation or a, a UTAF1 mutation. And then these data are overlaid with the next slide. They're overlaid with uh, cell surface immunophenotyping by flow. And you can see here that different cell populations um, have the P53 mutation uh, here in orangey pink, while other cells are more likely to have a UTAF1 mutation, et cetera. And certain clusters of cells have both. And so while this was early days in his lab, um, I think he provided some real optimism um, that this approach might actually identify um, some novel uh, targets for immunotherapy in um, MDS and AML. Next. Oops. Uh, Amir Seiden um, from Yale gave an overview of Indian checkpoint inhibitors in uh, myelodysphosic syndrome, and he started off with this cartoon that highlighted all the um, uh, potential targets um, that uh, may lead to uh, immune tolerance in the bone marrow microenvironment of the myeloid blasts due to um, receptors um, and blockers on macrophages, anti antigen presenting cells, NK cells, and T cells. He spoke a lot about the PD-1, PDL-1 access, the anti-CTLA-4 access, and presented the early phase and then more mature clinical studies. Um, testing them both in the relapsed um, refractory setting in HMA failures or in the upfront setting in combination with hypomethylating agents. And despite some initial promise and a good rationale for using uh, anti-PD-1 or L1, anti-PD-L1 inhibitors um, to augment a T-cell immune response against the myeloid blast, it actually hasn't been borne out in most clinical trials. Um, uh, and the only randomized trial that's been evaluated so far is a, a clinical trial he highlighted of both uh, of AZA plus anti pdl one dervalumab versus azacitidine alone in the frontline setting, and uh, there was no improvement in progression-free and overall survival. So it still remains to be seen whether or not immune checkpoint inhibitors um, that are commonly used in solid tumors are going to be effective, although he did make the point that it may be that in some cases, um, anti pdl one is more effective than anti-PD-1 or that you need the combination with an anti-CTLA-4. And he also thinks that combination approaches with, for example, venetoclax may enhance the anti-tumor response to anti-PD-1 antibodies, at least in this mirroring uh, tumor model, because it may be that because there's upregulation of these uh, memory effector T cells, that work better with these anti-PD-1 antibodies. He also briefly talked about the ongoing trials of sabotolimab, the anti-TIM3 antibody, um, with a signal in the early trials of perhaps more durable responses in combination with azacitidine, and of course the anti-CD47 we just heard about, um, which targets the don't eat me signal, um, that seems to be particularly effective in patients with TP53 mutations, but we're still waiting for the phase three trials to, to play out. 
Uh, Lucy Godley gave a beautiful talk, as she always does, about um, uh, considering germline predisposition to myeloid neoplasms or bone marrow failure. And she um, you know, made a very compelling case for why you can't rely on your somatic panels to detect germline mutations. Um, and, and in this beautiful table, she outlines it. But the major point being that these are fixed uh, panels, whereas they're constantly discovering new mutations for germline predisposition, so they have to um, be able to expand over time. And in addition, some of the variants for uh, germline predisposition mutations are in non-coding regions or due to copy number variants that are not being captured by our NGS panels. So you either have to do microarray, uh, microarrays or as they do in her hospital, um, augmented whole exome sequencing in addition to using customized bioinformatic analysis. And she also made the point that saying that the, you can see um, germline and somatic mutations in these genes, so these don't distinguish germline from somatic um, causes of bone marrow failure, and the variant allele frequency is not even helpful um, as well because you can have germline predisposition even at a VAF that's 25%, for example. The only scenario where you would probably know that this patient has a germline predisposition is if you find a CHECK2 or GDX41 mutation. And she gave, um, uh, you know, a beautiful uh, cartoon of how uh, at different ages the germline mutations uh, have phenotypic presentation of bone marrow failure or MDS. So for example, in very young children, um, usually you're going to find a SAMD9 or SAMD9L mutation. In kids between 13 to 25, it's CATA2. Between the ages of 18 to 40, the mutations that dominate are um, in DNA repair and telomere biology. Um, and then the extreme elderly DDX41 mutations. And we know that 20% of young adult AA or MDS have germline mutations. So we do have to um, consider them. Um, another trick to, to wonder about if someone has a germline mutation, if you didn't screen for it, would be if you're doing serial analyses of VAF in your samples and the VAF doesn't change and stays flat while other mutations decline, that would maybe support as well that this is germline predisposition. Um, extending, I think conceptually from Lucy Godley's talk, um, Dr. Akiko from Boston, uh, a pediatrician, uh, she talked about uh, mechanisms of clonal evolution in bone marrow failure um, states. And this was a beautiful presentation. She initially started by reviewing the relevance of testing for germline uh, predisposition um, in myeloid and other malignancies and enumerated some of the caveats to consider in such testing. And this list extends on the list that Lucy Godley already pre presented. In particular, um, she underscored again that somatic and germline testing gene panels are not interchangeable for a variety of reasons, some of which we've already heard about. Um, she also underscored again that VAF does not definitively differentiate germline from som somatic mutations. And then she proceeded to give some caveats and some unknowns regarding how best to have ongoing surveillance and the potential for intervention if one is doing ongoing surveillance. And then she moved on to her particular area of interest, which is the Sch uh, schwachmann diamond syndrome. Now, in schwachmann diamond syndrome, there are mutations in a gene called SBDS, which is essential for ribosome assembly, and this leads to impaired ribosome structure and function. Curiously, um, schwachmann diamond syndrome uh, may be unrecognized. It often goes unrecognized in young patients with MDS. And what's really interesting is that it frequently has pathogenic bone marrow TP53 mutations, both in the presence and in the absence of myeloid malignancies. Next. And so here's some, uh, here's a, a figure showing the screening of a series of patients. Each one of the columns is a patient, and you can see the genes on the left that were screened. And there are two key genes that are highly important here. One is e, E1F6, which is also involved in ribosome assembly. And the second gene is TP53. And you can see that both in patients with AML or MDS, or um, 
who only have bone marrow failure, you can see mutations in both of these, these genes. Um, and there's clonal hematopoiesis found in SDS bone marrows. And the pattern of mutations in, in Schmachmann Diamond syndrome is truly distinct from that that is seen in aplastic anemia, age uh, associated chip, or adult MDS. So it's a very interesting uh, model. And so how does this all fit together? Well, she showed that um, patients uh, can develop either E1F6 mutations um, after having an initial SBDS mutation, while some patients also develop TP53 mutations. And if you look at bulk populations from patients, they will have both E1F6 and TP53 TP TP mutations. But if you do single cell analysis, um, only one or the other mutation is found in individual cells. So while these patients would um, have a tendency to develop one or, or both of these mutations, um, they are mutually exclusive um, within cells. And how this might work is that the E1F6 mutation complements the SBDS mutation. So it makes the problem in ribosomal, ribosomal assembly go away, whereas the TP53 the TP53 mutation does not make the ribosomal uh, structure, the ribosomal stress problem go away, but it makes it not matter so much. So it's two different genetic approaches to the same defect. She so showed further that E1F6 and TP53 mutations are acquired early in life. E1F6 and TP53 mutations occur together in patients at the bulk level that are mutually exclusive at the single cell level. And malignancies in these patients, even though T53 mutations are found in a variety of patients who do not have not yet developed mutations, malignancy arises primarily from TP53 mutated cells and not from the E1F6 mutated cells. And this happens after the T53 mutation becomes biallelic. And there are a number of mechanisms for how this can happen. And what's interesting is that if you go back one slide, please, is that the, um, the biallelic T53 clones can be detected by single cell analysis months or years prior to the AML, to, to the development of AML. So over time, in, in one case, she showed it was years, you could see the VAF of this mutant P53 clone increasing over time, ultimately that patient developing AML. So there is a way in these patients to screen um, such patients with ongoing surveillance for the development of malignancies. It's a major undertaking that is only happening in, at the research level now, um, but it does provide optimism um, that malignancies uh, in these children can probably be intervened, can probably have interventions prior to the development, at least in some cases. Next. Theo DeWitt um, uh, presented an update from the general EU MDS registry, which, re which was recruited over uh, this period of time, a remarkable number of patients in uh, many countries. Um, and he highlighted some of the publications that have arisen from this very impressive uh, EU MDS initiative. Um, some of them that are, you know, I just want to highlight would be, for example, the importance of initiating erythropoietic stimulating agents early. And what they did is they looked at the patients who uh, received and did not receive erythropoietic stimulating agents. This is, as you recall, a low risk MDS registry. And they compared those who should have received ESAs by virtue of either being transfusion dependent or having a hemoglobin of less than 10. Um, with those that um, did receive the ESAs. And what they found is that the ESA treated patients that were untransfused had the best survival, um, um, which surpassed that of those that were untreated but untransfused, suggesting that there is um, a delay in the onset of transfusion dependence in these patients by initiating an ESA early. Once you ever, however, become transfusion dependent, that survival benefit is lost. He also looked at the impact or presented results from uh, looking at label plasma iron on outcome in lower risk MDS. And, and um, we had a very elegant talk by Heather Leach about iron metabolism in MDS patients, but patients who have LPI that's undetectable, who are transfusion independent have the best survival, whereas those who have both have the worst survival. And then in, in between are those who have 
detectable LPI or are transfusion dependent. So LPI would be a useful measure. He also um, highlighted, like we have seen in the Canadian registry, the benefits with, with careful matching of cases with controls of iron chelation therapy on overall survival and the potential hematopoietic benefits of iron chelation therapy with very long follow-up in a number of these patients showing that the hemoglobin can actually go up over time slowly in the patients um, uh, that um, are chelated. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. So uh, the next speaker was Dr. Sikaris, who talked about predicting responses to hypermethylene therapy and also some clinical management strategies. So there's been multiple attempts to predict response to hypermethylene agents, and they've looked at methylation profiles as well as specific gene mutations. However, none have been uh, reproducible or consistent, or else they're trajectory difficult to conduct on a routine clinical practice. So they've moved on to look um, at response prediction using artificial intelligence or machine learning. And the next few slides uh, tell about their endeavor uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Oh, I'm still on the other slide. Okay. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go back. Sorry. <laughs> Back the original one. So this one, like, the first one was uh, actually uh, data that it was accumulated from like about 400 patients who had more molecular profiling data available. And it was used to generate machine learning algorithms. And it was validated in a separate cohort of 113 patients from the SWAL 1117 study. And what they showed was that this could generate a um, modeling that was 87% uh, accurate uh, based on the uh, mutations they had. And it was also applicable um, to look at overall survival based on the number of mutations patients had, uh, less than or equal to three, and whether they followed the rule or not. Um, next. Um, so their second attempt at looking at artificial intelligence was getting um, data from about 400, 500 patients who had received four or more cycles of hypermethylene agents and had serial CBCs available. So the first 90 days of treatment, and they used really CBC and all the parameters involved with those results to generate uh, uh, a modeling uh, to predict response to hypermethylene agents. And using this model, they could classify patients into very low risk of responding to very high risk of responding and they validated it in a group of patients actually from Sunnybrook. Um, so I think more information is presented in Dr. Nasco's talk, which I think uh, Andre is going to discuss a bit further. Uh, next. Oh, uh, no, the other. So go back. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess his final words of wisdom was really with respect to managing patients on clinical trials. And really, the the point that he wanted to stress with that um, whatever schedule or drug schedule is used in clinical trials, it should be something that the centers can accommodate. And I guess one of the prime examples is azacitidine, which was done on a seven-day consecutive schedule, whereas most centers give it five, two, and two because they're not open on the weekend. Um, eligibility criteria should reflect real-life patients because a lot of the patients that are older have comorbidities, which makes them ineligible for the clinical trials, and also to provide some guidance uh, so that uh, physicians are less likely to dose reduce or do delays, um, and this will try to prevent um, patients from being taken off study before they've received about four to six cycles of hypermethylene agents, and therefore it may affect efficacy assessment. Um, also trying to figure out what the appropriate endpoints for the clinical trials are, probably event-free survival and overall survival and not CR rates. As we know from azacitidine, people that didn't achieve a CR still had a benefit with improved overall survival. And finally, because in the States, not so much in the rest of the world, um, drugs are getting approved based on earlier phase studies, so as to ensure that the endpoints that are chosen translate um, into uh, responses or outcomes in randomized phase three trials would have yet to be uh, performed. Okay, next. Uh, Corey Cutler, uh, 
presented a beautiful review of, um, uh, of, of, of optimizing allotransplant in, in BMT patients um, and reminded everyone that uh, despite uh, all of its warts, uh, allotransplant offers the only curative potential in this disease and improved survival. This is a donor, no donor uh, study that was recently published from the BMT uh, CTN. Um, and validates data previously shown by an Australian group and others. However, he, he gave the sobering statistic that despite the improvement in survival, that there's still a very high rate of relapse and uh, a very significant non-relapse mortality. So there's lots of room for improvement, which he discussed there's some strategies during his talk. Um, one interesting thing he highlighted that um, is of note is, is the importance of telomere length at the time of your transplant. So over the age of 40, your telomeres tend to plateau. They decline over time, but above the age of 40, they tend to um, plateau. But you can still divide these patients into longest telomere length, um, medium, medium telomere length, and shortest uh, telomere length. And um, it may actually impact how you do with your transplant. For example, uh, patients who have a myeloablative transplant have uh, inferior survival if they have um, a shorter telomere length. Um, and it's most notable in those with myeloblade, but also seen a little bit with reduced intensity. And this is due to increased non-relapse mortality in the myeloablative transplants. And it's not due because they have more graft-versus-host disease, but if they do develop GVHD, they tend to have a higher death rate from GVHD. So knowing somebody's telomere length, which is readily calculatable uh, with some uh, flowfish um, assays, could potentially decide on whether or not you should give somebody a myeloablative of a reduced intensity transplant. Um, and um, Matt Walter from WashU gave a nice review about the spliceosome and spliceosomal mutations. He highlighted the fact that not all spliceosome mutations are the same in every disease. For example, the hotspot um, locations of the gene vary depending on whether or not you have MDS or AML or MPN. Um, in the case of uh, MDS, for example, SF3 beta 1, this, this, um, this subgroup it predominates, but in U2AF1, there are two different isoforms. And the implications are different in most models where they do these transplant models with these different isoforms of these, um, with hotspot mutations. And what you find is that the impact on hematopoiesis varies. For example, with the, this U2AF1, um, uh, um, locus uh, for the hotspot mutation, it did, it had um, significant impact on recovery of the blood counts and also the hematopoietic stem cell cultures. Um, but this for isoform of U2AF1 had no impact compared to wild type. So it's not just enough to know do you have a mutation or not, but what isoform you have because this may impact hematopoiesis. And then he went on to demonstrate how how this happens because they have unique RNA splicing targets depending on what your mutation is. Um, he also discusses how splices on mutant cells are sensitive to drugs that induce R loops or drugs that can knock out the wild type allele such as oligos. Okay. Um, so uh, Eric Pedro presented his work on CMML and um, he demonstrated that, um, you know, CMML cells are sensitive or hypersensitive to GCSF, okay, which could be a hallmark for CMML. And therefore, a lot of drugs have been developed to try to target the GMCSF pathway, including against the GMCSF receptor and also against JAK. However, none of these studies have yielded really meaningful results. Unfortunately, there's no inhibitor available against stats. So the other uh, potential target is really looking at BEC proteins, which are regulatories of the GMCSF-dependent STAT5 transcription. Unfortunately, single-agent BEC inhibitors have not yielded any clinical responses. Um, next. So he went on to do a uh, combinatorial drug screen with BET inhibitors against three other, sorry, 300 other compounds. And one of the findings was SGI1176, uh, which is a pan-PIM kinase inhibitor. And below you see that uh, the combination of BET inhibition and PIM inhibition 
is synergistic and prevents bone marrow engraftment by CMML cells in mouse xenograms. So it's believed that the BET inhibition leads to increased uh, PIM expression, and this is because of decreased expression of the MER33A. Also, when you have PIM overexpression, a subset of cells is a becomes PIM addicted and it becomes sensitive to PIM inhibition. Um, when we overexpress MER33A, you can partially rescue this PIM addiction or overexpression after that inhibition. Uh, next. So he believes that the working model should be that um, bromo domain 4 binds to the promoter region of SREB2, this leads to upregulation of MER33A expression. When MER33A is expressed, it attenuates or limits the expression of PIM, and therefore cells are not sensitive to PIM inhibition. However, when BET inhibitors are administered, the BET inhibitors bind to the bromine domain 4 region and prevents it from binding to the promoter region of SREB2 gene. Um, therefore, you don't get any transcription or upregulation of MER33A, and you get overexpression of PIM. This therefore leads to the PIM addiction and sensitivity to PIM inhibitors. And right now, I think he's still working on the pathway. I think it's part of the downregulation of um, MER33A that's observed with the BET inhibition could be switching from STAT5 to STAT3 signaling. However, this provides some preclinical evidence that maybe a combination of BET inhibition with PIM inhibitors could synergize and be an effective uh, combination treatment in patients with CMML, especially since we don't have a lot of treatment options available for, for this group of patients. Next. I'd like to uh, briefly tell you a little bit about the talk from uh, Dr. Uh, Nasa Aziz. Um, who's currently with Amazon, but he was previously at the Cleveland Clinic, and he was involved in those um, art, in those artificial intelligence initiatives that Dr. Sakaris already alluded to. Uh, next. He started, um, thankfully for me, he started off by defining all these terms, which for a artificial intelligence novice like me was absolutely essential because I had never... Um, learned about these things. Next, he then moved along to the diagnosis and treatment of, of MDS using the current clinical approach and outlined where there are problems um, throughout this patient trajectory of diagnosis, staging, and treatment that might be improved by an artificial intelligence approach. Next, he then did um, work through to come up with an artificial intelligence algorithm, um, which is uh, usable on, on a, at a website, but he stressed for research purposes only. This is the same uh, program uh, that Dr. Sakaris was referring to. You can put in patient characteristics, both uh, uh, clinical and demographic, and come up with a survival and a diagnosis. And then he went on, next slide, uh, to show how successful this artificial intelligence approach was compared to conventional diagnostic diagnoses. So, for example, the new um, machine learning model uh, was better at predicting overall survival um, than any of the standard uh, scoring systems. It was better at predicting leukemia-free survival, again, than any of the current um, currently used models. And in addition, and this was already alluded to, I think, by, by Karen Yi, um, this model also was very, very good at predicting response, um, where the, the ability to predict response with any of the existing models is extremely poor. So this artificial intelligence model that he showed was better at diagnosis, better at predicting overall survival, and better at predicting response. It's early days here. Um, but I think when you consider some of the vagaries of, of um, MDS diagnosis, this approach is going to be highly, highly useful, particularly when coupled, coupled with the uh, mutational analysis, for example, um, as reported at this meeting by Ellie Papamanuel. Next. <clears throat> 
finally, I'd like to say a little bit about Jacqueline Boldfoot's presentation. This was just from this morning, uh, entitled Insights uh, from the MDS Transcriptome. Next. She initially started off with a review and a reminder uh, that from uh, normal stem cells through to pre-malignant stem cells through to MDS and then through to AML, um, that there's non-linear clonal evolution with additional mutations occurring at different time points on average uh, during this process with earlier mutations, for example, of splicing factors and epigenetic modifiers and later mutations being transcriptional regulators and genes involved in, in signal transduction, for example. Next. And she pointed out that investigations of this sequential process has been very helpful um, in MDS, not only for furthering our understanding of disease pathophysiology, but also that some of these initiatives have identified new prognostic markers and treatments uh, for treatment, and also have pinpointed uh, new genes um, that contribute to, uh, to the disease. Next. So she then went and gave nine historical examples of transcriptional changes during um, MDS development. And then she focused on recent data in three areas. And I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, first, she focused on MDX, pardon me, MDMX, um, and demonstrated that MDX um, overexpression is a mechanism of disease progression. She then talked about disease progression mod modeling in induced um, pluripotent stem cells using CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce a variety of mutations sequentially um, during hematopoiesis, and specifically the mutations that were introduced were introduced were mutations in ASXL1, SRSF2, and NRAS. And then she talked again about aberrant pre-mRNA um, pre splicing. Um, particularly the IRAC4 NF kappa B pathway uh, that we've heard about several times already today. Next. So I'm not going to read through these slides, but essentially she convinced everybody that MDX, MDMX overexpression is highly important in inducing a transition from a pre leukemic um, cell to AML. Next. Um, here uh, is a cartoon showing the sequential. Um, introduction of mutations um, via uh, CRISPR-Cas9 um, approaches. And while it's early days for this, this publication of how to do this was just published. I think that this will provide considerable insights going forward um, into how MDS development and progression actually occurs. Next. And then again, she, uh, again, to focus on um, spliceosome mutations, um, she showed earlier work from her lab uh, looking at SF3B1, SRSF2, and UTAF1 mutations, and which genes are aberrantly expressed as a result of these mutations. Next. And she then, uh, again, uh, worked through the IRAC4 pathway and demonstrated um, that with all of these spliceosome mutations, the final common pathway for all of them is likely NF-kappa-B activation and uh, increased inflammation. A very interesting talk. Next. Okay, so um, I am not going to be able to do justice to Dr. Rachel's fantastic and comprehensive talk this morning um, about information concerning pathophysiology of iron overload, outcomes of chelation, as well as the tests that are being used for determining iron overload. So I'm going to refer that uh, the, the audience probably go back to her session because it was excellent. Um, and then I'll just focus on the last slide, uh, because I think one of the key points is that uh, there's actually an MDS Iron Road, which is an online or soon to be online um, guideline that can be accessed uh, by typing in the password, uh, sorry, the, um, the, uh, the URL and the password and username, and it shows it gives guidelines as to diagnosis work and the management of MDS. But I would refer everybody to your talk; it was fantastic. So uh, this reaches the end of our presentation. Uh, we really want to thank you for attending the meeting. Um, we hope you found this review helpful and uh, motivates you to go back and and view the talks uh, in in their full form.
because we probably didn't do them as much justice as we would like due to the time constraints. Um, we are now, Karen and I are now passing the baton to Dr. Norbert Bay, who yes. is going to be chairing the MBS meeting in Marseille in 2023. And let's hope that this will all be in person, mask free, and that COVID will be um, in our rear view mirror. So thank you very much. Let me thank Karen and Rena for all their hard work to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.